Hello everyone, I'm Tony Stevens, Dean of the College of Business at Lipscomb University. Our guest today on Conversations with the Dean is Bill Lee, CEO of the Lee Company, a business founded by his grandfather seven decades ago. In 1992, Bill became president of Lee Company with revenues of $20 million. Today, as a $100 million comprehensive facilities, solutions, and home services company with over 600 employees, Lee Company was named recently as one of Tennessee's top five best companies to work for, both in 2006 and in 2007, and was named the Nashville Business Journal's best business for 2011. Bill is also active with the International Justice Mission, an organization that brings rescue to victims of slavery, sexual exploitation, and human trafficking around the world. This is a faith-based organization that is doing amazing work. His leadership role in his company and in the community make him an extraordinary guest. We launch this season of Conversations with the Dean with Bill Lee as our guest. Bill, welcome to the Lipscomb campus. Thank you very much, Tony. It's a privilege to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you. Thanks. As always, we Thank always you. welcome you to the campus. Bill, I'm fascinated by the story of a business that has now transitioned through three generations. Very few businesses are mm -hmm. able to successfully transition even from one generation to another, much less through three. And after you took over the business, you grew it by a factor of five times, from $20 million to $100 million. How did your family manage to do that? Well, I think that my, uh, my grandfather was a... Um sort of a classic uh, guy that was that came out of the depression and hardworking maybe I think he had a third grade education and became a self self-taught uh, mechanic who was just really putting food on the table for his family and then in the meantime created a company he was entrepreneurial and what started off as just providing uh, turned into a, a company a small business he had two sons, my father and his brother, my uncle, who uh, went to Vanderbilt Engineering School. And when they came to work in their father's very small family-owned business, they brought a new level of, um, of desire, really, and vision and entrepreneurism and professionalism with uh, engineering degrees. And they began to transform what was then called Lee Refrigeration Service Company into uh, Lee Company. And they really created the foundation. By the time I came to work there, the foundation had been laid for a company that had a lot of potential, that had uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hope for growth. And really, those, the foundation was laid for those of us who then came into the company to just begin to build on top of that foundation. And, and did you change the strategy of the company or did you just simply um, make it grow bigger using the existing strategy? Well, our strategy has continued to evolve. I will say that when I came to work there, we were fairly, um, uh, we were fairly narrow in the kinds of customers that we served and the types of services that we offered. Who we are today versus who we were uh, 20, 20 years ago is significantly different. Um, so, I would say diversification of services has been something that we've worked at really hard in the last 10, 15 years. So you've become more of what, um, maybe this is not quite the right term, but you've become more of a total solution provider. Right. In fact, that's, we, 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 we began to brand ourselves a little differently s several years back um, as a solution facility solutions company and a home services company mm -hmm. you know we have traditionally been known as an air conditioning and plumbing and electrical mm -hmm. company and w those are our core services we provide uh, hvac which is heating ventilating and air conditioning plumbing and electrical um, and security but we provide a lot of other services besides um, those core services that have historically been who we have been as a company um, we have, we really have two 
uh, sets of customers. One are residential and the other are non-residential. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then the breadth of offerings of services that we have are focused on those two customer groups. Now, I know from uh, reading a little bit about the, the company and particularly some of the history under your management that you've had both your ups and downs. I think you went through a period where you right. even had to reduce the size of the business pretty significantly. Right. Uh, I'm sure that was a traumatic thing. Uh, how did you how did you get through that period yeah. and still reemerge uh, with as much success as you found in recent years? That was clearly the most challenging business uh, event that I've ever faced. We um, we had grown very rapidly in in Jim Collins' Good to Great book. He talks about too many new people, too many new customers, too much uh, to, to growing too fast. Mm -hmm. and, and we, in fact, did grow very rapidly. Over a period of probably 98 to 2003, we were doing over $100 million worth of business in, in 2003. Uh, and we lost a significant amount of money in a very short period of time. We got, I, I, really things kind of went out of control. We had remote offices in other states and we lost control. And um, we had to restructure. We reduced our revenues from about 100 million to about 65. Over the next 18 months, we laid off 400 workers in 14 months, which was very painful. We closed down remote offices, shut those down. We really just uh, had to retreat and retrench and uh, reemerge. And it's really the biggest change in our company has occurred as a result of that um, struggle. Um, I, I think that struggle produces, adversity produces a lot of good things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in life in general. But in, a, in the life of a company, at least in the life of our company, we walked out of that and we learned from mistakes and we, we, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, let, let's don't ever do that again. And in fact, Let's redefine who we want to be and uh, so that we can kind of set a new course for the company. And, and that's, that's what we've done from 2003, for, really for the last decade. There's so many aspects of your life that I, I want to explore, but before we leave the business part of your life, let me just go back to the subject of transitioning from one generation to another because we, we encounter so many family businesses here at Lipscomb and, and uh, we're asked to provide advice to people who are struggling with the issue of, you know, how do I incorporate my children? How do I pass mm -hmm. this from my management to another generation? Uh, people want to give up control so they can go to Florida, but they want to retain control mm -hmm. so that things don't get messed up. How did you, how did your family <clears throat> deal with that? You know, I think uh, those are very unique and challenging situations that probably every, every family business faces, ours as well. Um, I'm not sure how my grandfather and his sons dealt with that. But um, my father and I uh, and my uncle had a very good relationship. We had a really good working relationship and we had a good, really good personal relationship. That was helpful. We also, I also had no siblings involved in the business and had no interest in, in being involved in the business. So um, that made it much simpler as well. It was pretty much just <laughs> myself dealing with the older generation of my family, um, but it was difficult. I mean, there were some difficult conversations. There was, you know, there was tension. There were different management styles, g generational styles of how you do things. And really, we just had to communicate a lot. We, my father and I in particular, had some very blunt sit down uh, conversations about you know, who's in charge, who's not, who's gonna be, where, where do we really want this to go? And I, I credit my dad because I think it's very hard, I know it would be very hard to let go of something that you had poured so much of your life into, mm -hmm. so much of your identity is wrapped up in something that you have created, which he, he was largely responsible for creating what Lee Company had become, and then to kind of let go and let someone else do it and differently than you would do it or than you may even think is the way to do it. But he did that. He was able to let go. It was hard, but he was able to let go and th therefore we made that transition. And I, you know, I have two boys that are um, uh, seniors in college in engineering school who may well decide, 
one or two of them may well decide to come into the business and will face, and it even becomes more difficult the larger your company becomes because you've got senior management teams that are sure. that are in place and uh, we'll face those difficulties but they're they're certainly worth facing when your dad had those conversations with you uh, did he talk with you as a father talks to his son or did he talk with you as a business colleague a CEO talking to a subordinate with I think it? most of our conversations were father and son even though you were business even associates. though we were business associates we agreed to disagree mm -hmm. and primarily I think it was generational style mm -hmm. and and me trying to make certain that he understood that just because I wanted to do things differently did not mean that the way he did them was wrong and mm -hmm. mine was right they were just different mm -hmm. and uh, that's sometimes that can feel like my way is wrong if you don't want to do it my way and and but we communicated a lot I, I do think the key is just communicating even when it's hard even when you don't want to walk in the office and sit down and say, I've got to talk to you about this because it's really bothering me and mm -hmm. I, we need to get through it. Um, we, we were able to communicate our way through it. And you know what was great? I mean, we today, uh, my dad has been incredibly supportive of where we've taken the company, where it's going. He's been a, a great advocate of mine and uh, you know, I'm a great fan of my dad. Well, that's a great family story. Now, Bill, you've had some challenges in your family uh, other than, than business challenges. Uh, you lost your wife in a very tragic accident. Right. Uh, not long after that, you very nearly lost a daughter. Right. Uh, I know those were challenging times. I know you're a man of faith, and you, you make no secret of that. That's how you and I first encountered each other through, I think, the Board of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Talk to me about what, what happened, uh, not so much the details of it, but mm -hmm. just... How did you get through that period of your life, and what, what did you learn from, from those yeah. tragic circumstances? Well, that would be, uh, that would take a long time, but I, I, I will try to uh, sort of bring some of the highlights of that. Certainly, it was a devastating experience in my life. I woke up one day, uh, the most privileged, happiest, you know, blessed man on earth, and uh, in a few short hours, it, it seemed to all have blown completely into a thousand pieces, and uh, I was devastated. I had four young kids, um, four, nine, nine, and 14, and it was overwhelming. Um, <clears throat> I do remember sitting there, uh, even at uh, the church with a casket laying there, and uh, my four kids sitting on the front row and me walking down the aisle toward them getting ready for a service and stopping and kind of, you know, having a conversation with God said, I don't see how this is ever going to work out, but I do, uh, I do trust you. And I believe that uh, I'm going to have to trust you a lot in the next um, few, in the next season of my life. And I learned more about him and our relationship became uh, more dramatically valuable than it had ever been in my life. Um, my faith clearly was that which carried me through what otherwise was uh, just a, a very difficult place. I had a lot of support, I had a lot of family support, a lot of help uh, and encouragement from friends. Uh, the body uh, uh, around me um, was very supportive and very helpful. I couldn't have been more more blessed and more supported and more helped by people. So I, I never had to do that that thing alone. But um, it was, you know, I, I referred earlier to adversity um, producing transformation. It was clearly uh, the most transformational time of my life. I, I've I've said before. I don't like what has happened to me, but I like what happened to me in mm -hmm. the process. Um, it's true that suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope, which doesn't disappoint. It, it's, I now know that's true, and that's something that can never be uh, taken away from me, that knowledge and that understanding. I'm a deeper, richer, more purposeful uh, person than I ever was before. 
do I wish that it had never happened? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, it's redemption is what mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. when we when we have struggles and we see even on this side of heaven, we still see the, the work of uh, transformation out of adversity. So. And, and God honored your faithfulness. Uh, you're remarried. You have a wonderful, I beautiful do. bride. I have a wonderful, and beautiful I'm wife. I'm sure she's a tremendous blessing, each of you to the other. Uh, your children are doing great. That's and, right. And so those are all blessings. I guess I, guess I would ask you, what, what would you say to another family who might be struggling with the same, mm -hmm. the same challenge? Mm -hmm. We all know mm -hmm. families that have lost children. Mm -hmm. We lost a track star here mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago mm -hmm. in a tragic automobile accident, a young man who was about to be a sophomore uh, who died in a, at, at home in Pennsylvania before school yeah. started. What, what would you say to a family struggling with that? You know, um, first of all, I would just say that no one knows your struggle but you. I do remember feeling, and it's a strange feeling to think that you in some weird sort of way, you think that you're kind of the only person that has ever experienced this. You know that it's not true in your head, but your own personal grief struggle is very personal and it's very much your own and nobody understands it. And so my, whenever I meet someone, it's I, I never want to kind of come across as I know how you feel because I really don't. I know that I can only imagine that what they feel is devastating. And... Um, but whatever they're feeling, it's, it is devastating. I will, what I tell them though is that, or what I would say is that I know for my own life, there is great hope and there is hope for uh, healing. There's hope for wholeness. There's hope for children. There's hope. It's a very uh, long and difficult and painful, but there's something uh, even beautiful about that painful journey if we will embrace the concept that you know what God's in it and he can use it for transformation in our own lives you know if you really think that there's something I, I remember having a conversation with my daughter who was 14 when her mom died and we were riding down the road and I remember saying to her even uh, Jessica do you get this weird feeling that there's something good happening in the middle of this terrible thing that we're facing? And she kind of looked at me and she said, you know what, Dad, I do. And even kids, if they realize, if they can grab a hold of hope that this life is short and that there is, uh, there is hope and healing and wholeness and if we will pursue it and embrace it and, 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 and uh, follow it, then uh, there's hope. Now, you're a man of many interests, and as I said a minute ago, you and I, I guess, first encountered each other, at least on a, a personal basis, uh, when we served together on the board of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes here in Nashville. But you've been on many, many boards. You've chaired a number of, of uh, organizations' boards. I know you've chaired the uh, Tennessee Prayer Breakfast for the mm -hmm. governor. Uh, you're now involved in, in what I think is a very interesting uh, organization, the International Justice Mission. Right. And, and I was fascinated as I was reading about that. I did not know that there are more slaves on the planet today than there were at the time of the Civil War, which yeah. I think is a, is a monumentally challenging statement. Tell us about the International Justice Mission. The International Justice Mission is... Um an organization that was primarily um, started by a group of attorneys, uh, a fellow by the name of Gary Haugen, who heads up the organization. Um, it was an accomplished attorney who, um, who formed this group that primarily is an advocacy group, an advocate for uh, those who have no voice. And there, it, it's, a, it's a long and complex subject, this idea of slavery and human trafficking, sex trade, but there clearly are around the globe, there are areas um, where, you know, eight, nine, ten-year-old girls are held in bondage and are um, kept for the sex trade. They've been taken from families, they've been 
abducted and or sold from families that were destitute in poverty. And uh, there, there are a lot of reasons why this happens, but there are a lot of people in the world out there who have no advocate and no voice. And the legal system in some of these areas will not defend or bring to justice perpetrators of, uh, of injustice. And this group targets the worst of those areas around the globe, goes in and works with the existing legal system to be an advocate for uh, those that are um, and, and those that are being uh, dealt this injustice, those that are being held against their will. And primarily what they do is they go after the perpetrator and they uh, put them out of business as opposed to just rescuing those who are being harmed, but it's really try to go after the root of the problem. It's a significant organization. It's worldwide. It's, um, it's doing great work, and uh, I've been involved with it um, for the last several years. And this year, um, Matt and Sarah Hasselbeck, uh, quarterback for the Titans, and Maria, my wife, and I are co-chairing the dinner that is for raising funds for this group. Now, that dinner is scheduled. Uh, September the 25th. And so by the time many people watch this, that dinner may have mm -hmm. already occurred. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyone interested in, in helping with the mission of the International Justice Mission could go to the website, That's right. I presume, and could get more information about that. So when you talk about slavery, mm -hmm. uh, I guess my mind goes to the American slavery system, uh, slaves that were held for economic gain and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, sex slaves, I guess, would be hell for economic gain. Mm -hmm. But these are mostly females, mostly children, uh, or young teens. I yeah, guess. and there's and also men are involved in in, in slavery as well. The, and, the, and the way that may work is uh, that uh, for a for a fee, someone might uh, sell themselves to or might uh, sell themselves to a bricklaying factory. Uh, we will pay you. We will give you a loan if you will come to work for us and then we will pay you to pay back that loan. Well, if the arrangement is set, set up such that the loan can never be repaid because the, 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 um, the payment to that person is so low that they can never repay, then they're in bondage to that employer forever. And if they live on a compound and they're not allowed to leave and what happens is they find themselves slaves. They find themselves unable to leave and unable to ever pay their debt off, so they're uh, indentured to this um, to this guy forever. They leave their family, they're taken from their families, separated from their families, put in these work camps, and they 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 never leave. Um, so it's really just a, a manipulative way of creating slaves. And so that system in a in a given country wouldn't necessarily be part of the of the legal system, but it'd be winked right. at by the government it's and just allowed part of the to transpire. Cultural, part of the cultural mm -hmm. um, caste system or whatever, in whatever country it is, however it works. How, how does uh, IJM, the International Justice Mission, manage to break that, that cycle? How do you get people away from that, that form of bondage? Well, they have hundreds of people that are, on the, that are in the field working in different countries in different situations, in different circumstances. Some of them are, you know, oh, some circumstance may just be, uh, you know, girls, underage girls that are held in brothels that are not allowed to leave. And they will raid, have raids, arrest, free the girls, uh, work with other organizations that then, uh, you know, rehabilitate these girls and give them skills and reintroduce them into society so that they know something different than what they have um, been accustomed to. And there are so many different situations in different countries and different ways that this whole human trafficking works that the people on the ground have to individually deal with that particular country, that particular culture, and that particular issue uh, of human injustice. and you know, that's what they're about. Finding out those kinds of human injustice situations, going into that area, working within that culture, that legal system, that police force. They, they work in edu with educating the police on what to look for and how to break these things up. So it's kind of an individual situation. Mm -hmm. 
We've only got a couple of minutes left, and I, I, I appreciate your candor, and I guess some of these have been a bit heavy uh, questions. But let me, let me turn my attention back to something a little bit lighter. Let, let's talk about Cool Springs and Franklin and Williamson County. Your, your business is based in the Cool Springs area. Right. You're very much a part of the Williamson County business infrastructure. Uh, we've just learned that the three chambers in that area have voted to merge into one, which sounds like probably a very smart thing to do. Uh, tell me about the future of Cool Springs and Franklin. Where do you see the economic uh, future of that area being? We've all been fascinated by the incredible mm -hmm. growth that's transpired out there. Where, where is all that headed? You know, I think it's um, going to continue to surprise us, honestly. I, it's interesting. I grew up in Franklin. Uh, my family lived there my whole life, really out in the country in a little community called Fernvale. Went to public high school in Franklin High, and uh, so I've known Franklin since, you know, from, from 50 years ago. And we moved our business there in uh, 1998 when Cool Springs was really still pretty new. I mean, the, our, our actual business location, which is on Mallory Station, that had to build the road and put a cul-de-sac in for us to get a building occupancy mm -hmm. Uh, because there was, you know, we, they were actually cutting hay in that property when, when we bought when we bought it, and then they had begun to subdivide. So it was pretty early on when we bought, and the transformation has been, you know, uh, astonishing and continues to be. I mean, I, if you go down to the next exit, McEwen, and you get off of uh, that exit, you see things that you didn't see a year ago. You see roads opened up that weren't there before that even surprised those of us who've been there for 10 or 12 years. Um, I think Cool Springs is um, a reflection of what's happening in Nashville. Cool Springs is a great spot. Williamson County is a great place to do business. But Nashville and Middle Tennessee is a remarkable uh, business environment and quality of life environment. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise kids. It's a great place to raise grandkids. I, I, I'm a grandfather as of last week. Congratulations. Thank you. So. Um, I think Cool Springs is going to continue to move forward as Nashville moves forward. And I think Nashville has got a lot of bright future to it. We, even through this difficult economic time, I think we've done quite well mm -hmm. and um, I'm very encouraged. Hey, I appreciate you wearing the purple tie today. Yep. I hope yep. you did that in honor of the purple and gold <laughs> at Lutzman University. Absolutely. But I, but I just have to... Uh, pay respect to your alma mater. I know you're a graduate of Auburn University right. and I, I have one of those in my family too, who happens to be an engineer. So I understand the uh, loyalty that, that Auburn Tigers have to uh, the mothership. So War Eagle. That's right, War Eagle. Thank you. And uh, Bill, let me just say again how much we appreciate you being here today. You're, you're a delightful person and a great friend. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for being so candid it's totally my privilege this is a great you know Lipscomb's a great place it's a great organization it's great what you're doing here and and uh i'm i'm really glad to be part of it so well, thank you we're honored to call you a friend thanks thank, thank you for being here my guest today has been bill lee who is the ceo of the lee company thanks for joining us thanks for being a part of conversations with the dean today we'll see you again soon